Hello, Crosspoint family. Happy 2024. You made it to a new year, and God has something new for each one of us. In this first month of the year, January, we're in a series called One. This low number has the highest priority. We're looking at what it means to have one Lord, one love, one life, and one leading. The highest priority is one because it puts God first, it makes community a must, and it focuses us on having a life of impact. How many of you are not where you were? How many are you rejoicing that Jesus met you? And, he, and what I love about Jesus is he's, he keeps his word to us that he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even if you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you always. My rod and my staff will comfort. And he is a God who sees and he is a God who hears and he is a God who answers and he is a God who keeps his word. Now, one of my favorite um, names of God, El Roy, is what I've always thought of is the God who sees. And that's always comforted me when I look out at creation, when I read his word, when I delight in his presence. And I've always thought, I love that God sees. Do you like that? Do you like that name? He is a God who sees. But this week as I was studying in preparation, the Lord brought a gift to me, and he's going to bring a gift to you. In case you didn't know this, the translation isn't just the God who sees, but is the God who sees me. And I want, as we go into this message, before I read the scripture, I want us to personalize this message on the front. And so we are together going to say, the, he is the God who sees, and then say our name. He is the God who sees Joni. He is the God who sees right where you're at. He is not confounded. He is not dismayed. He is not unable to enter in into that circumstance and bring redemption. That's who he is and that's what he does. And um, he is the creator of heaven and earth. When I was in South Africa, I, so I got saved in 1994. And in 1995, I heard of this opportunity to go teach in South Africa. And um, I grew up at Our Lady of Perpetual Help on Lyons Avenue. I went to all, I went through um, fourth grade there. I was confirmed. I was, um, I'll, I did a lot of the, those things. Um, I actually went to confession when I was in second grade, which if you've never done that, I do not recommend it. No stars, no stars on that. But um, I am reminded that God because when I was growing up in the Catholic Church, I think I, I knew I was called. I knew I was called, but I didn't know where I fit in. But God saw me. And he saw me not where I was, but who he was calling me to be. And the circumstances of the limitations of where I was, physically and emotionally and even spiritually, we're not going to define his promise for me. So on 2, 3, 7, 4, 5, Via Canella, you can go by after church. That's where I grew up. And that house wasn't the house always of peace and grace. There was a lot of confusion and contention in that house. But in that house on my wall, I think my grandmother must have given it to me, there was a sign with my name on it, Joan. And underneath, God's gracious gift. And under that, the scripture from Psalm 23, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And even though there was brokenness, there was a lot of pain in that household, God has kept his word to me. 
and he is still keeping his word. His word will not fail you. He will never, he has not rescinded his word of hope to you. So we're going to dive into Genesis 16, but let me give you a little preface. This is like the real housewives of the Old Testament. Okay, so, so just be prepared that, yes, this is in the Bible, and yes, this is exactly what it says. So I'm going to read that, and, and you may say, Does she, is she aware of what she's reading? Yes, I am, I am aware. I'm aware of what I'm reading. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abraham, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show you who's wrong, you or me. Anyone ever heard anyone talk like that? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Because can't you imagine? I don't think, I don't think Sarai, some, I, I don't think Sarai was like, honey, let's talk about this. I don't think that was the moment of this. I think this was the moment, the emotion of it. And poor Abram, any brothers in the room? Feel it? Feel for Abram? Like, what are you going to do? She's coming in high. She's coming in high. She's hot and heavy. What are you going to do? And he replies, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. And then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant with, and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. The son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Ber Lahai Roy, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth, gave Abraham a son, Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So I think we are to find comfort in the context of this story. That there is contention, there is confusion, and this is in a household of God. <laughs> these, are, these are those who were called out and into God's promised story. So, God is a God that works even when we are a mess. Anybody else ever a mess? Anybody else in or have ever been or have ever heard of situations that are confounding, confusing, difficult? You know who shows up in that? God does. Because Lord have mercy. <laughs> we need help. We need help. I need help all the time, all the time. And only God 
can take the confusion of our world, including the confusion we create and contribute to, and redeem it. Right? Because no one in here, you have all come to the party and you, you brought your stuff. Right? Anyone else ever think, it was only, it was all them. It's all you people. You know, I, I, I have not brought anything into the, oh, no. I have stuff. Do you want, I, 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 do you want, want to know my stuff? No, you don't. Well, we'll get there eventually. But we all have stuff, and, 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 and yet God is a gracious God, and he is going to keep his promise. All the people in this story, Abram, Sarai, and Hagar, all made mistakes and all contributed to this confusion. But God covered them. And God covers you. He covers me. God had promised Abram, if you go back a couple chapters, he had given Abram a great promise. He, when he called Abram out of Haran, he said, I'm going to lead you to a place and I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you and then all the nations will be blessed through you. It was a huge promise. And Abram went and Sarai went. And they had no children. And they had no children. And they had no children. And then Abram had an encounter with the Lord where he brought him out to see the night sky. And God spoke to Abram and said, Look at the sky. That is a picture of the descendants that will come from you. So many to count, so vast to comprehend, and such an incredible promise of God that God would do that for Abraham and through Abraham. And then he went back inside, and there was no child. And not just for a couple of days or weeks. It was years that they were waiting for the promise to come. Each of us have dreams and desires and promises that God has placed in our heart, but the weight of the weight is excruciating. Can I get an amen? And anybody ever in the wait come up with a, your own plan? Like, I know you created the heavens and the earth, God, but I think you might be having a little trouble getting this thing that you've promised me going, so I'm going to help you out. That was Sarai. Like, there's, there's a plan B. Let's, okay, Hagar, let's go. Abraham, let's go. This is what we're doing. And then... Anyone else other than me, you're in a plan of your own making and it's really not going great? Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And he does. That's what he does. Is When we do those things that, like in retrospect, you're like, maybe I should have paused. Maybe I should have considered how this would go down. But God is a merciful God and he will keep his promise. And how does he keep his promise? At, before we get to chapter 16 and the confusion, there is a covenant that is cut. And it is very important for us to recognize this powerful story of the promise of God. So God and Abram were entering into a covenant. And at this time, in this day and age in this land, this is how people came to agreement, is they would cut animals in half, and they would make an aisle. And what they were agreeing to, they were making a covenant that if either broke their part, that there would be blood to pay that in some ways they would become like 
you break the covenant, you become like those that were cut in half. So it was a costly thing. It wasn't like uh, shaking a hand in an agreement. It wasn't just a contract that would be maybe decided and, and there would be just a, a payment given that was in cash or like that. It was, it was going to cost you something dearly. And so Abram prepared the sacrifices. He set up the bloody dial, and he was prepared to walk it with the Lord. But this is the best part. God caused a deep sleep to settle on Abram. And then God, the very presence of God, the holy God, the mighty God, he revealed himself in a flame and like a burning, like smoking, um, a, like thing that was an offering. And it was the presence of God and the very presence of God walked that aisle. Only God. God would keep his promise to Abram, even when Abram messed up. Especially because God knew Abraham was going to mess up. And that is us with the Lord, and in Christ, he has paid the price for our salvation. He has paid the price for every sin, every mistake, every misstep. Jesus has covered it all. And he has not only walked that bloody aisle, that he was the one that was cut in two for our salvation to purchase not just a promise for descendants but a promise for eternity and there will be a day there will be a day church when we stand before the lord and he sees not our failure he sees jesus and that's how he looks at us today that so I don't know if you're like me, but I think that because I mess up pretty regularly, that maybe I'm disqualifying myself from God's promise. Thank you, Jesus, that you've covered me. So I believe God wants to deliver people today from a, a shadow of condemnation. You know who's going to keep his word to you? Jesus. You know who covers you when you mess up? Jesus. You know who will help you in the time that you don't understand, that you are confused, that you are heavy-hearted? Jesus. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he promised us the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Truth, the Comforter, the Encourager. He promised it was better for him to go that the Holy Spirit would come. And we are the people who live in the promise of the Spirit coming. So we, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome in my life to continue to resource me and assure me that you will keep your word. Anyone else open to that work of grace? and peace and strength. God will keep his promise because he paid it all. So, um, in this world we will have tribulation, but Jesus said, be of good cheer. So we can do the both at the same time, that we can be very present in a situation that is, is not our choosing, because if you look at Hagar, you know what choice Hagar had in this? Zero. Um, it wasn't like, hey, Hagar, we were thinking about this. What do you think? No, it was like, hey, Hagar, this is what we've decided, and here you go. And I know there were times in my life where I felt like I was decisions had been made, and I wasn't at the table. And I... I don't like that. I don't like those times. I don't like those times, but God is the one that sees. He saw Hagar. And he reveals himself to the one 
who did, no one asked, no, no man asked her choice, but he sent, but the God of the heavens and earth sent an angel to give her a word of hope. And the hope was that she would have a son. And that hope was that that son would be, be named God Hears. So if she was going to have a son, that means that she was going to live. So there was a promise of her life, but basically God gives her the same promise as Abram to an extent is that you are going to have a number of descendants. So not only are you going to live and your son's going to live, but there's going to be a lot of people living after you that you are the forerunner for. It's an amazing proposition that the God of heaven and earth sees the Egyptian maidservant who had no voice and gives her a promise, and he keeps his promise. The one that was not at the table, he made a way for her. So we may find ourselves in different parts of our lives being Maybe we're like Abram, maybe we're like Sarai, maybe we're like Hagar. But I want us to camp on Hagar for a minute. I've felt like Hagar. I'm sure many of us in the room have. And there have been things that have, decisions that have been made, and I didn't understand. And not only did I not understand, they deeply wounded me. And God calls us to be reconciled. He, we were reconciled to God through Jesus, so he has given us the spirit of reconciliation. We, we reconcile with each other. So it was well over a decade ago that I was in a situation that I was deeply hurt and really had a very, very, very hard, dark season. And I was weeping and crying, and the, I, I'm a big justice person, so I was having a hard time because I felt like it was so unjust what happened to me. And the Lord, he gave me a long time to do that, and then I sensed the Holy Spirit one day go, okay, are you ready? And I was like, oh, what? He's like, are you ready to own your part? And I was like, what? My part? Don't you know all of that stuff that happened to me? And in that season, another brother in Christ had become a scapegoat for me. And I, in my pain, I was speaking ill of him, and I was saying things that were not right for me to say. And the Lord said to me, you need to go and ask forgiveness. You need to confess, and you need to ask forgiveness. And I did. Not in my own strength, but simply out of sheer obedience. <laughs> and I would say it was probably not the most beautiful apology you've ever heard either. But I did it. Thank you, Jesus. Because that, that offense and that root of bitterness and that cesspool and sewage line of unforgiveness was cut off. And so there's nothing between my brother and I in that relationship anymore. And I'm, I'm better for it. Thank you, Jesus. Mercy, mercy, mercy. But then in that situation, there was the one that said very cruel and unkind things to me. He was very mean to me. <laughs> I was probably, I will admit, I probably said things out of order. I, anyone ever done that? Okay, just so you know, like sometimes, I don't know, you're getting to know me, like I sometimes say stuff that maybe I shouldn't have said. Okay. Um, so I had done that, but the Lord I knew was calling me to forgive him. And I had not seen him in a long time, and I was actually, because I had heard about his health, I thought, I might never see him again. But I did see him. I saw him last May. And when I saw him, all I could do 
was go and hug him and tell him that I loved him, because I do. So that is the work of reconciliation. That is what we are called into. We are called to know that God who sees us is leading us into all that he has for us. But he is calling us to hang in there, church. We are to hang in there because there is a story that Jesus tells of the the shepherd who has the 100 sheep. And there's one that wanders. And the shepherd goes after the one just like um, the Lord sent an angel after Hagar. But I, it was only a couple years ago that I realized when that shepherd leaves the 99, he didn't leave them in like this nice cozy sheepfold. He left them in the wilderness in an open space. So in this season, we need to hold tightly to the hope that we have, but we also have to hold together. And you've done that, Cross Point Church. You've done that. I commend you for it. And God sees you. And he sees me. And he, you know what the great thing about the Lord is? Even when we bail, he chases after us. Even when anyone else, fight or flight, it's real. It's real. It's real and let the Holy Spirit bring you back. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of places in your own self that you need to own to. And let us watch the move of God as we walk forward together. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this church family, Lord God. I thank you that you see us collectively, but you also see us individually. And you hear us, and you, Lord, I think of that, I'm thinking of the scripture of Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And the hope, one translation means a hopeful end. And Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that we are in process, but we trust you, Jesus, that you are the good shepherd. We shall not want. You will lead us beside the still waters. You will bring restoration to our souls, and you will get all the glory. And even now, Lord God, we praise you. We praise you, Lord, that you have not failed us. You have not left us in this wilderness. You have been with us. And you will not fail, Lord God. Your word to us is true. And we say yes and amen to your work of mercy because, Lord Jesus, we need it. And as church said, amen. Thank you, honey, for that good word. God is good and his word is true. It was wonderful being together today. Thank you for being with us in this series one and in today's message. I pray that there was one thing you heard, one thing you received, and even one step you can take from God's truth. Speaking of steps, right below, there are steps that we could take together. You could click on the links for a connect card to learn more about what's happening at Crosspoint in the month of January, and also to give, to worship with your giving. I pray you have a great week and we can't wait to see you next Sunday at Crosspoint.